four, three, two, one, zero. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction. So today's topic is kind of different than OSINT. I know we've, we talk a lot about OSINT. There's so many different fields within open source intelligence. But the topic today is something that we often miss out on. We start doing investigations. Uh, we, we look at all these tools, all this automation and stuff, and we just, you know, have at it. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to consider to protect ourselves because a lot of these tools we may not know what they're doing on the internet what they're doing with our computers they may be exposing us uh, so if you're just doing like friendly stalking or just looking someone up for a linkedin connection or whatever it's fine i mean your threat level is pretty low there you're doing research um, but if it's anything more serious than research if it's journalism background checks or stalking a stalker or going after someone who's you know bothering you or doing proper investigations for maybe law enforcement or um, like with the innocent lives foundation uh, with all those scenarios you, you need to protect your um, footprints your digital footprints because you are going to be leaving a lot of footprints everywhere so let's start with what my background is because you'll see a lot of that when I speak, when I talk about things, I'm going to be all over the place. I'm going to be a little technical, a little bit um, focused on maybe tools, techniques, things I do, and this is where it comes from. So I have a very strong background on the networking side of things. I came from um, uh, as a solutions architect, uh, a network engineer. I worked for Cisco for a, a short period of time. I was I am a CCI in routing and switching. So a lot of the techniques are heavily focused on the IP, on the network side, on how computers talk to each other. And I feel that's very important when understanding what you're doing online. But then I transitioned into an ethical hacker. I like breaking stuff to kind of figure out how to protect it better, how to reinforce it. Um, I'm certified in you know, as a hacker, as a social engineer, um, as as a privacy advisor, I do OSINT investigations professionally with my own company. And uh, now I take all of that knowledge as a virtual chief information security officer uh, for my clients. And I design more strategy than tactics. I start the discussion more high level. And I wrote a book on it as well, if someone wants to check it out, The Phantom C. So it's essentially my process on how I went from a highly technical field networking hacking and stuff and elevated my cybersecurity leadership skills to become a CISO for a few organizations so that's kind of my background it's all over the place but uh that's that's what i do so we won't be talking about osint but the precursor to osint which is opsec or protecting yourself so what does opsec or operational security involve it's most of these things that you see on the screen so I'll be touching a bit on my usage of VPNs, password managers, how I use aliases to um, protect myself. There's some advanced stuff I do for disinformation, not applicable to everyone, but you should know. Sock puppet account creation, why it's so important. Um, browser, I guess this is the most important piece right there. We all use browsers for probably 99% of our OSINT investigations. And browser is very important, how you configure it, what tools you use within a browser, the plugins and stuff. So I'll, I'll go over those in a bit. And obviously basic security stuff. I won't be touching much on security. All I'll say is, yeah, MFA on all accounts. Make sure you know all of your security basics are in place, password managers, uh, MFA, um, and uh, whatever other options there are in the cloud portals that you may be using turn them all on um, burner phone numbers virtual credit cards and I'll end with um, self auditing and doing OSINT on yourself after knowing that you've protected yourself from um, 
your, your online presence. And during this time, Mike, please feel free to interrupt if there are any questions in the chat. I, I'm not monitoring the chat. There's just way too many windows for me here and there. So if there is anything in the chat while I'm talking, just interrupt, say, hey, Michelle, we have a question and uh, we'll, we'll take questions as we go along. If not, if you guys are shy, uh, we'll have plenty of time towards the end to take more questions. But let's keep it interactive. So let's start with uh, <clears throat> anonymizers as a general category. So the whole goal for this is to anonymize your presence online. You don't want to be caught in the wrong place at the wrong time with your footprints like your IP address or your browser user agent and, and stuff like that. So how do we hide those things? Well, the common um, you know things or tools used are VPNs for this. A lot of people would use Tors or proxies or different operating systems. So what do I use specifically? So the gist of this conversation, and, and I've seen many presentations around you know everything from cybersecurity to OSINT to privacy and stuff, and people sort of give this, this idealistic approach on here's what everyone should be doing. They should be on an operating system that doesn't track you, use, um, what is it, tails, on a USB drive and inside tails, there should be the Tor browser and all of that should be you know, wrapped around a VPN and stuff. And that's maybe an ideal scenario. No one does that. No one in my community that I know of um, does uh, OPSEC to that level. Um, there has to be a balance between usability, functionality and privacy. So this presentation is not ideal on how you should do it. This is on how I do it. And hopefully you gain some insights on how a person like me does it, a person who um, provides his OS OSINT and privacy services to clients. So I take this stuff pretty seriously. And so before you start saying, oh, this is not ideal or you're leaking this or that, just a disclaimer, this is just my way. This is not the best way. Um, and everyone's um, approach to this may be slightly different. So how do I do it? I use a VPN for everything all the time. And it's just habit. Um, so the VPN of choice I use is Proton VPN. And you can actually see I'm on a VPN connection right now. It's given me a US based IP in New Jersey. And um, it's always on um, on my uh, machine. It's also on my phone. If I'm ever browsing on my phone, it's just always on. I only turn it off if I encounter any issues with um, the VPN itself, either it's too slow or it's giving me connection issues, which is extremely rare. And if I do turn it off, then I make sure I'm not doing anything sensitive. Um, in fact, if I have issues, I just don't work on my computer anymore. I'm paranoid about VPNs because it masks your traffic to the ISP first and foremost. So a lot of the times when we're browsing the internet and we're going on these shady websites to do investigations, um, who's our threat vector? I mean, who's going to get us? The hackers or you know someone else? Well, all, all of the above. Um, you may go on a website that will log your IP address. That website may be taken down at some point and then the FBI may go through it like breach forums. We've all known of those um, breach forums that, you know, are there today, tomorrow they get taken down, or they may be a honeypot by um, the FBI or the CIA or whatever three letter agency. If you've logged into those websites, well, your true IP is there. Now you've inadvertently become a suspect. Uh, they don't know if what you were doing on the website, were you using it, were you um, posting material, uh, abusing it, or just doing your research. So. You're first essentially guilty because the IP address leaves, leads to your home, and then you have to pr prove your innocence. So for scenarios like that, I've seen way too many scenarios where people have been caught with their IP addresses in some database, in some breach, um, and or with law enforcement, and now they have to prove their innocence. So my thing is, yeah, always on um, VPN, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm having this video broadcast through Zoom and stuff. There's no lag. There's no issues. Um, 
it's, it's a paid VPN service. It's not the free version of it, but even the free version of Proton is pretty good. So use a VPN service that doesn't log, essentially, which is uh, Proton, Malvad. Um, there's a few others that have a no logging policy. Use those so that if um, law enforcement or, or anyone else, or they get breached, let's say, um, your, your IP addresses are not stored there. So that's probably the biggest piece of advice is try to protect your home address because your IP is your home. So I'm trying to avoid someone knocking on my door, either bad guys or law enforcement or whoever who don't really know what I'm doing. I'm doing good, but I don't want to, you know, defend myself for something I didn't do. So this is more about safety. So this privacy aspect is more to do with safety. Tor, I do use every now and then. Um, very rarely, I want to say, I only use Tor when I'm surfing the, the dark web. So there are a few links in my repository of links uh, within OSINT, which uh, point to the dark web, they're .onion links. So I have to use Tor for that. And those are mostly smaller uh, resources like a forum or some maybe breach monitoring website. Uh, most of these ransomware websites that post their ransomware demands and their dumps are on the dark web so i have no option but to go to the dark web for it i don't go there to read forums or to check out um you know posts and, and stuff like that there's very little to no useful information there it's at least not for what i do um, so i do use tor for that but when my tor browser is on um and tor the tor browser is essentially a, a firefox browser so when Tor is on um, and loaded and I'm browsing through websites, a VPN, VPN is also running in the background. So it's two layers of protection right there. So don't think that just by using Tor, you're, you're protected. Yeah, sure, within the Tor browser, your activity is kind of masked because it goes through multiple areas. But let me kind of pivot to a story uh, here. There was actually a bomb threat with one of these Ivy League colleges, I think it was Harvard. Um, there was a kid who decided to play a joke and he did, and he posted a bomb threat from his computer in his dorms. And he just wanted like the whole school to evacuate because of a test or something typical. And law enforcement came in, the police came in, the FBI got involved because it was something big. And almost immediately they caught him. How? It's because the IT administration of that college uh, saw somebody on their network was browsing the Tor network and the Tor exit nodes have well known IP addresses, they're all listed, they're all marked as Tor exit nodes. So in whatever monitoring software they were using traffic monitoring inside, they could tell that yeah, this traffic is going to a Tor node, we don't know what that traffic is. But the threat was posted um, on the dark web and which means somebody was using Tor and from all of their traffic from all of the students, he was the only one who was using Tor and they had his IP address, his dorm room IP address. So they caught him almost immediately. So they didn't know if it was him, but he admitted because they presented the evidence. So the point here is, I have a saying in privacy, you want to be the hay in the haystack. He was the needle in the haystack he stood out, his Tor traffic stood out amongst all the other traffic out there. So our goal for privacy when we're surfing the internet is to be the hay in the haystack, blend in. So don't use Tor unless you absolutely have to. If you do, make sure you're behind a VPN first and then Tor. Another third method to browse the internet is use a, um, a browser that's not in your environment. So, um, uh, there's a website called, called Browserling. So this is a browser that's hosted on a machine that's somewhere out on the internet on some data center. So if I go to, let's say, um, outlook.com and hit test. So this is the free version. They give you, I think, three minutes of browsing time. And I actually use this website for malicious links. Sometimes there's like a link in an email or something. So here you go, the, my timer has started on the left. So I have three minutes to browse whatever this link is. And this browser won't affect me. The IP address of this browser is somewhere 
out in the internet uh, on in some other data center if i go to let's say ip uh, location dot what is it dot net dot org or whatever let's see it shows me an ip address of canada montreal canada whereas my vpn says uh, new york so it's it's some other data center somewhere else it says the data center name as well and a windows 10 so it's masked it pretty well the operating system is wrong the, the platform is incorrect uh, the, the screen resolution is not what my resolution is so all of the user agent stuff that i'm going to talk about later and um, this browser has kind of um, dealt with it obviously there's a paid version of this i just use it every now and then the the three minute version of this to see what's behind the link maybe it's malicious or not um, if something actually gets downloaded here, like malware or whatever, it stays within that sandboxed environment. And they probably recycle through this you know, hundred, hundreds of times a day, the, uh, these virtual machines. Um, so use this as a tool in your arsenal for looking up shady links or shady websites. Um, and th there are plenty of other tools like this as well. they are browsers that are built to do just this. Uh, I think Authenticate uh, is one that, that does this. I don't use it, I use this one. I use BrowserLink because it's free, it's quick, and it serves my purpose. Pause for any questions that you have. So for BrowserLink, I was just commenting in chat. Uh, it reminds me of Chasm. Have you ever used Chasm before? Yes, I have, like back in the days. <laughs> Number of years ago, I used it once or twice, but I don't use it often. All right. But yeah, they're similar concepts. Um, they're basically sandboxing the entire environment. For this to run properly, you need a dedicated operating system and then a browser inside of it so that it's contained within layers of, um, um, let's say, the, the OSI layers. And you can get a good idea of, uh, so here's one reason you want to do most of these things. So here's a very popular OSINT tool. And um, most of you have probably heard of this if you're in OSINT, what's my name and dot app made by Micah Hoffman. There's a command line version of this tool as well and a web version. In this tool, let's say you put in um, John Doe as a username and you click search. It searches through at this point, what, 625 different websites to see if this username exists amongst all of those websites. But where is this traffic originating from? It's originating from your browser in the back end through, I believe, through JavaScript and stuff. So it's actually going to all of these websites like about.me and whatever, Facebook, Twitter and stuff from your um, internet traffic, uh, internet connection and from your browser. So you're actually visiting these websites. So it's good for automation. I've gone through 600 or so links within a matter of a minute but you're also leaving a trail. Uh, and that's why they have this category of all, all exclude, um, not safe for work websites, so pornography and stuff. And you want to do that because if I search this and it's searching for some you know, you know, shady websites, pornography in particular, it may get blocked. Or if you're doing this from a network that's not yours, like um, office network or some other public network, which you should never, and um, now they're logging the data and they may either block it or flag it and say, hey, you as an employee or user were browsing, you know, shady websites and now you've been flagged. Now you're under the radar and stuff. So you don't know what a lot of these OSINT tools are doing in the back end and how they're affecting your traffic internally. Now I have a lot of internal protection in my browser and I know a lot of these things will fail. Um, I use next dns to kind of block my traffic so even if it is going to porn websites it's gonna get blocked but i won't see that failure here if i was using the command line version of this i would see a lot of fails happen um, there's ways around it but be wary that even a simple tool like this exposes your internet traffic so imagine your isp notices this and you know they they kind of monitor like law enforcement says i want everyone's traffic in this region, in this whatever five mile radius, whoever browsed 
you know pick on one of any of these like say, rare websites um, seven cup or whatever sounds bad but let's say somebody browse this website and they want to know now i will inadvertently be part of that um you know geofencing order and say oh this guy used that website when in fact i don't even know what the hell that is i just ran a tool that pinged that website so now the isp has that info that's why i use vpns so now the isp is blinded by all of my traffic they don't see anything and yeah, we've seen so, certainly where some u.s states now are uh blocking or requiring some form of verification to certain website services too now um and of course some countries as well uh mm -hmm. have issue with some websites too so again using a vpn with multiple ways to exit uh can help avoid those types of situations as well uh we do mm -hmm. have a couple of questions here before we get too far sure. uh, nate nate was asking uh, he had two questions i think they were both related to browser link mm -hmm. was uh first how does authenticate work and second he's heard of a lot of OSINT investigators using it but can it be paid for anonymously the authenticate is the browser version of this so with authenticate you have to download a browser and it creates that environment within that browser for you i don't use it so i can't talk to you in depth about um you know how you pay for it and stuff i don't know their payment uh, methods it, it could just be credit card i don't know but they're a big you know corporate company it's not just a small little tool and it is a paid tool now so they have a free trial i've used the free trial it was good uh, for a while but um, yeah, I can't answer questions on payment. I don't know. And do you know if Browserling itself, uh, you said there's a paid part of their service. Does it allow anonymous payment? I don't know either. <laughs> I've never okay. paid for it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and then CW had a question. You speak of a way to mask yourself yet on OSs like Windows, key loggers are turned on by default. Does that not give you away on investigation key loggers are turned on by default i don't understand that so first of yeah. all i don't use windows um i'm on a mac but that key logger log statement, logging in general you know there's a lot of logging i mean the operating system logs everything yes um yeah i mean if you want to really prevent yourself from the operating system calls and someone asking the operating system company either microsoft or apple about you then don't use their products simply use linux because linux has no background calls um, without your knowledge without your consent and um, apple and microsoft both do so there's telemetry that's going on in the back end yes that may or may not expose you but there's ways around it so i take that balance of i use a mac for uh, my as a daily driver I'll, I'll jump into Kali Linux in, in a bit. I use that as well. I use both. But for normal stuff where my threat level is not that high, for normal investigation stuff, yeah, I'll do it on a Mac in in Firefox. And knowing that, yeah, Apple does have some information on what I've installed, what I do online. Um, not a lot, but it, they do. At the same time, I would add one more layer of privacy to it. I don't register my mac devices or i don't have an apple account that's under my name it's an anonymous account under an alias name alias everything phone number payment system so even if they do some checks on me the most they will find is an ip address but not associated to me per se can they go a step further sure they can but at that point now my threat level is nsa or something or i've, I've got, gone rogue or whatever that's not my deal Almost everything I do right now is official. It's signed with clients, with whatever. If I share information with law enforcement, same thing. They know exactly where everything is coming from. So I really don't have that threat level. I'm not a bad guy, so I'm not hiding from them. Sure. Yeah, I, see, I saw in clip after we asked the question, uh, they provided some additional clarification. They thought that things like autocomplete experience telemetry, which you mentioned that one, uh, were some certainly some of the things that would collect uh, information. Yeah, so telemetry um, is something that's 
collected and the site you mentioned um, earlier privacy.sexy can disable uh, a lot of the telemetry from windows and from mac so this is thing like uh, on a mac there's siri like my mac is so hardened that siri doesn't work a lot of the other uh, telemetry stuff doesn't work like if you go here under just mac os and configure or privacy let's do privacy cleanup it has all these things browser stuff xcode and clear system caches and ios usage and and all the background stuff it sends back and forth for troubleshooting or bug reporting and stuff like that you can disable almost everything it may break some functionality um like i can't do facetime calls and stuff because i have disabled so many things but i don't need to i use a signal for, for those type of things but yeah out of the box there's a lot to disable on a mac and a windows and on a linux there's very little uh, to disable from a privacy perspective so yeah if um, if that is you know your use case um, then sure like go through this and be as private and secure as you can on the operating system of your choice. What I've noticed as an investigator, I need speed, I need proper tools, I need Microsoft you know, Office for reporting, I need Microsoft Excel. There's no equivalent on Linux. You know, dare I say now the Linux people are going to attack me, but I don't care. Uh, I work in corporate environments where I need Microsoft Word uh, to function properly and Linux just does not you know, you know, do it. I do use Linux and I'll jump into it in a bit. And I use Kali Linux and I have the same setup as I'm going to go through today on Kali Linux, like the browser setup at least. So I do perform a lot of my investigations there, but then I'll take a screenshot and bring it back into Mac and then put it on um, uh, a Word file because I need a proper documentation. So I don't think I'll ever go away from a conventional operating system like um, uh, Apple's uh, OS. I'll probably won't ever do Windows. Um, I just like how the Mac operating system works better for me. But I do have a lot of Windows machines as well, virtual machines, because I do like to test things out on a Windows environment as well. Um, from an OSINT perspective, I think there's very few tools that only work on Windows. And that's why I had the Windows machine. I think there was a tool called FOCA, F-O-C-A, for um, metadata analysis that was originally just on Windows. Um, the, the, there's alternatives to it now. But yeah, if you have a situation like that, yeah, go ahead, harden those systems using a tool like this, and then use them. Um, other things I would use for my privacy is Bitwarden. So as a password manager, but also for generating random usernames. Bitwarden has the feature where I can generate random usernames, um, not just random passwords. And I would use that for all websites. Any new website that I uh, make an account on, yeah, Bitwarden's plugin would kick in and I would choose a random username, random password, you know, MFA, everything else, and just store it in there. Um, so that's my tool of choice when it comes to password managers. The other one I use, so if this is like a corporate client and stuff, and I'm doing a lot of work for them on the privacy side and creating accounts on their behalf for cleanups and stuff, I may or may not use Bitwarden, really depends. I, uh, then I'll use KeePassXE to keep all of their stuff in their compartmentalized environment. So KeePassXE will have a file and I'll just keep everything in that file offline. Bitwarden is more for me because it has cloud access. I need it to sync between this and maybe some other devices and my phone. So it's more of a convenience thing. The other thing on the network side, like while we're on it, is NextDNS. I, I have configured NextDNS on my environment. And uh, so what NextDNS will do is all of the traffic will go through it. And I'll see, let's say, let's look at some analytics here. Actually, let's look at some logs. So you'll see a lot of log files on what's been blocked, what hasn't been blocked, um, and different calls that um, different websites will, will make back and forth. But next DNS is very powerful because all of your DNS will flow through here. And then you can start controlling different stuff like block ads. Primarily, it's an ad blocker but it also does a lot of security things here. So it'll block categories of websites um, and 
so many other things. So by default, this is always on. I've configured it in my browser as well as my router. So it's it's on multiple layers. A couple of things with NextDNS I was commenting in here. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who have heard of Pi-hole before, yeah. um, that NextDNS is fantastic for when you're not on your network where you have your own Pi-hole. Uh, mm -hmm. When you leave your network, NextDNS is basically your Pi holes traveling with you. Uh, it has mm -hmm. like the same capabilities that, as if you were on your own, which is really neat. Um, yeah. But then also something that I found out is that it seems like some, I don't know, maybe they stopped doing it now, but for a while there, it seemed like some of the browsers were um, default turning on the DNS over um, HTTPS or whatever. And that yeah. would actually stop it from going through next DNS or Pi hole. And there's some devices and even some apps that are hard coding their own DNS. So it will bypass any of the DNS on your network. So in order to capture that traffic and reroute it, you end up having to have firewall rules to block and redirect calls to a port 53 or other yeah. known. Um, or in Firefox DNSs. and Chrome you can actually put in that string for your um, DNS proxy. There's a settings in Firefox where you can actually point your DNS here and it'll go through your instance of next DNS. Uh, so Perfect. no matter what other settings you have, so even over HTTPS and, and, and everything else. So it kind of forces your browser to go through this DNS setting. And this way I can be on anyone else's network while I travel and my browser will still point its DNS to next DNS. That's awesome. The rest of my operating system may not, but at least my browser will. And like I said, almost all the traffic that originates from my computer is browser based. So one, one thing like you, you may see if you don't configure this and you turn your VPN on, now all your traffic goes first outside the VPN and it uses whatever DNS your VPN is using. And you can't configure that in most cases. So then you're actually bypassing next DNS. And that's actually the way I've set my computer up um, right now is when my VPN is on, um, my Firefox has all the traffic go through next DNS, but my Chrome browser doesn't. It's like a stock Chrome browser. I didn't change much of the settings there. And I keep it that way because I sometimes websites break and I don't want it to go through a filtering service. And I just want to see how that website looks if I don't block any trackers or, or pop-ups or any, any other thing. So it is useful in certain scenarios. And I use simple login as well for creating um, burners. So going into the next topic of burners, oops. Um, another major thing that you will definitely need while you're doing OSINT is burner accounts. These are accounts that are not in your name. They don't lead to you in any way. I've seen a lot of OSINT folks do investigations and this they're browsing Facebook and Twitter, other people's uh, you know, uh, profiles and investigating, and they're using their own profiles. I'm like, don't do that because a lot of these platforms will inform the other user. For example, LinkedIn, notoriously, and everyone knows, tells everyone, like if you have a premium account, it'll say this person viewed your account unless you set your privacy uh, settings where uh, it's disabled, but by default, that's what LinkedIn does. Uh, so does um, Facebook. Um, they don't tell you exactly, but they will eventually say, you may know this person. And it's like, like your name would pop up to your target. And you don't want them to know who you are. So be careful. Uh, in fact, don't do it unless you have alias accounts and burner um, email addresses and phone numbers and physical addresses and credit cards. So let's get into that a bit. How do I do burners? So for emails, I use simple login. I have a paid uh, Proton Mail account, and with that, simple login comes free. If you are actually part of a nonprofit organization and you have a nonprofit email address, like from a church, mosque, synagogue, or whatever, or uh, Innocent Lives Foundation, that's the one. Um, if you own any email address that has a 501c connected to it, simple login is actually free. They don't advertise it, but you have to email them and say, hey, I'm part of a nonprofit and 
they'll ask for proof and you'll get a free simple login account with that account you get more than the standard 15 random aliases you get much more the upper limit is a couple of hundred i think but um use this for randomly generating email addresses on the fly but another better tool than this is um, duckduckgo's stuff so duckduckgo.com slash emails or slash email and you'll get to this page where you can generate a random duckduckgo address so if i if a website asks me for an address i'll just use this or just say generate one more and it'll generate a random address now this goes back to whatever account i've set in the back end um, my proton mail account or whatever and all those emails go there if i reply to someone who sent me that it'll also go through this email proxy of duckduckgo and send the user the reply sort of like what simple login does um they 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 kind of come in between you and, and the other user as a proxy. So you can reply back and forth with these um, and they'll never know your personal uh, account, whether it's Gmail or ProtonMail or whatever. So you're masking your um, email address this way. An older service, which people still use, and I still have multiple accounts on this is 33Mail. But 33Mail is not ideal um, anymore because I don't know if they've mentioned yeah i think they have it here so this is the format of the email that they give you 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 choose where it says you here that's your username so let's say i choose you know a username called mk my initials mk.33mail.com anything before that i can randomize so if it's for i don't know facebook i can do fb at mk.33mail.com and it'll go straight to me or so whatever random stuff I put before the ad, that'll go to my personal email address. But you see the problem here, that everything after the ad is still pretty unique. And you don't want it to be unique. You want to mix in. So if one website gets breached with at mk at 33mail.com and somewhere someone realizes, oh, that's Michelle Khan, then everywhere else where I've used and that alias doesn't matter what randomness I put before the ad. I've been exposed because of that unique username. So I don't use this anymore. I, I, I was using this for a very long time for years until these two other services popped up uh, recently, the last couple of years. These randomize it to a very good degree, especially the DuckDuckGo one. And it's unlimited and it's free. Uh, so I use DuckDuckGo for almost everything. The only caveat here is some websites may say, oh, can't use an alias account because they've flagged at duck.com as a um, alias email so some won't allow you but those that do um, use it as your first um, option so that's emails and i would stick to these three and i wouldn't do emails like the temporary ones like generator.email it'll generate your temporary email completely random you certainly don't want a dot ru email um, but every time you refresh you get a random email uh, you, you can choose their domains as well but all of these are flagged and these are actually inboxes. So uh, there's another one called mohmal.com. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I have a lot of these on uh, in my um, browser uh, bookmarks list, but I don't use most of them anymore. Um, email on deck and stuff. It's because you don't control anything with these. They, they give you an inbox, which is either temporary or they're storing the emails. Um, to reply to it, you have to get into this platform, reply using their um, you know, features that, that they have. You have all, almost no control. Whereas the other three that I mentioned, Simple Lock and, and DuckDuckGo and, well, not 33 mail anymore, but those three are, they, they don't have any inboxes and stuff, they're proxies. They take your email, change the email header on it, and forward it on to the destination and get the reply, change the header back, give it back to you. Um, so they're just proxying emails. So use proxy services, email services, rather than actual temporary inboxes. I think the only use case for this, this for me is if it's something completely junk, like I need to get into a website that is forcing me to create an account and I literally just need it for a day or a week or whatever, and then I just want it to like burn away or whatever, uh, nothing left, then I may use this and real quick and 
get in with just an email address and that's it in and out an even better way to do this so if websites don't um, uh, allow you to make burner accounts using alias emails because they've banned the duck domain or the simple login multiple domains that they have and you're like uh, what do we do now there's a few big websites that will flag almost all of these and say it must use a corporate email or a legitimate email address or a well-known one like gmail or hotmail they'll, they'll allow those but they won't allow burners then i would take the route of buying your own domain go to name namecheap buy a 99 cent domain there's literally namecheap.com slash promo slash 99 cent domain names and buy a domain name for a whole year for like a dollar roughly um, and doesn't matter what that domain name is you you can pick um, the, it's very limited in the actual top level domain that they give you but this is for burner accounts now that you have that um, you can configure it for free in cloudflare to kind of forward all emails that go to this domain whatever something dot link to your inbox and now you can sign up for services and still make your domain unique and not flagged by most of those systems. So I have plenty of these at hand um, that I use and I let them expire sometimes because I may not need the service after a while. It's just a dollar. Another way to do this is when I'm doing phishing engagements. Yeah, I, I still do a lot of pen tests and stuff for clients. So I need to buy domains. Um, I will buy expireddomains.net because these are domains that people have let expire and they have history. So a lot of these domain checking websites uh, will, will flag your domain because it's too new. Let's say you just bought a domain from you know, Namecheap and those websites will be like, oh, it's less than 30 days. Uh, this is a brand new domain. They'll block you. They won't let you register. So some will take it to that level to, to check. Well, in that case, by expired domains, they will have a history of uh, a decade, sometimes a few decades, um, and they'll have breach records as well. Some check breach records too. So that's another way um, to get proper legitimate domains. So more aliases. Um, so there, there's other um, avenues where you will actually need credit cards. Like I signed up for an Adobe account the other day and I wanted their free trial. I gave everything burner. I was on a VPN, burner, email address, everything burner. And then they're like, we need a credit card on file, um, even for this free trial, because after the free trial, they were going to charge me. So I gave them privacy.com, uh, generate a random credit card, give it to them and pause the credit card. So now even after the free trial, when they um, start charging you, it just bounces. Um, or I set a limit to $1 for every new credit card that I generate. And whatever they charge me over one dollar, it's it's not going to go through. So it's a good way to mask it. Um, some people may be saying, "Well, if they really want, they can find out who owns that credit card." Yeah, they can because privacy.com is like a bank where they do KYC checks on you, know your customer. So to open an account, you need to connect your real bank account with them. You need to give them your real name, your real identification because they need to follow laws. Um, but whatever credit card they provide to others, then the randomly generated cards, they're pretty anonymous where the end user doesn't know. The only way they can find out is if they ask privacy.com with a court order or a subpoena by law enforcement. And that's when you've committed a pretty big crime at that point. So for criminals, that's a good thing. Since we're not criminals, we should have no fear on worry on um, what information privacy.com has on us. Previous to this, what I used to do is uh, Citibank has this feature as well, where you can go in your Citibank account. They're called virtual cards, exact same concept. They're free as well as this. So you have a couple of options there um, when you're, pr you're forced to give out a credit card uh, for any website. You can also use it for anonymous payments. I say anonymous, you know, tongue-in-cheek it's not really anonymous but it's anonymous to the end user if it's a shady website or whatever and they're getting a privacy.com credit card well they're not going to go through a subpoena and court order to figure out who you are because uh, they're shady 
Um, but for stuff like that, yeah, I wouldn't use this. I would probably use cryptocurrency at that point, Monero, or buy a credit card, a temporary um, Visa gift card from a store in cash and use that there. So those are some of the ways I would do payments online. So that's burners. Um, another thing I kind of touched upon while I was talking through is randomization of stuff. Know that you're going to be in a breach where we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of accounts. I think the last time I checked my Bitwarden uh, vault, I had over 1000 credentials, like 1000 websites and their credentials stored in it. Um, so it just balloons up very quickly. So you're going to have a lot of usernames in there, randomize them, even for personal use, like for my bank accounts and for my social media accounts and stuff. They don't have my true email address. I think at this point, nobody has my true email address. It's only maybe one or two major services, but the rest, they have a randomly generated email address from DuckDuckGo or a, uh, or a domain that I've bought, which I can control, where they ask for usernames, same thing. Why give your name as a username? Because when we do OSINT, remember privacy is the inverse of OSINT. When we do OSINT, we use username tools like um, what's my name dot app or hunter um, dot io for searching emails and or um, uh, and on Kali Linux you have uh, so many other tools that parse through usernames. Well, when we're using those tools, I don't want to be caught up in that same tool. So if somebody gets one of my usernames, well, guess what? All of my usernames are randomly generated. So to automation tools like that should not work on your profile. So make sure your usernames are randomized, your emails are randomized, and your passwords are randomized too. Because another technique I use for OSINT is I have a lot of password breaches. I look through those password breaches, I find a perpetrator, they're using some random, you know, proton mail uh, uh, email address, and they have a password, which is a word, a complicated word with some uppercase, lowercase, exclamation marks, whatever. I take that password and I search amongst all my other breaches, and I find more email addresses that are using the same password. And these are different email addresses. So depending on the uniqueness of the password, I can most of the times tell that this is the same person because the password is so unique, but they're repeating passwords. So it's a basic cybersecurity <coughs> rule not to recycle your passwords. Um, and that's why make sure you're using password managers, mix it up. <clears throat> Sometimes I think that I will still stand out because my passwords are like 100 characters long. And if I'm looking at a password dump, everyone has normal passwords. And then suddenly you see this 100 character long password. I'm like, that must be Michelle. <laughs> so use it wisely, but randomize everything. So when creating aliases, now we're getting into actually creating an alias. Now that you have the infrastructure in place, your emails, your phone numbers, actually we didn't touch on phone numbers. We we will in a bit. Um, I skipped it. Well, let's touch on phone numbers. What about VoIP numbers and stuff? Well, the best place to start for VoIP numbers is Google Voice because it's free, because it's very easy to use. And to be honest, Google Voice numbers are not flagged everywhere. There's still a lot of places you can get away with with a Google Voice number. So use it if you have Google accounts, create multiple Google accounts, multiple aliases. If there is one caveat to Google Voice. You need an actual SIM number first. So go out, buy a T-Mobile Mint SIM. This is probably one of the few investments you'll have to make in OPSEC. $2 worth, um, buy a trial SIM set. Sometimes it's for $1. You get seven day free trial and you get two SIM cards. Load it up in a new phone, a, a, a dumb phone or an old spare phone and start signing up for a lot of the services, social media accounts that will not accept a VoIP number. Um, Google Voice, which needs a SIM number to assign you a, a virtual number. So once you've done that in that seven day trial, they won't ask you ever again for verification for that SIM number. Let the number expire. Now you have a permanent Google, Google Voice number. I have like five or six of them right now. Uh, I think only a few of them accidentally expired because I didn't use them for a very long time. But that's one way to kind of keep a good number. Um, 
if you want to truly VoIP burner numbers, there's apps like textnow.com. This app is uh, on the phone. Uh, they have a web interface too, but it, it never works for me. It's All I see is this stuff. It's probably because I'm behind a VPN and, and stuff. I was but I can never even because you're you're not human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I can always log in and I get to this page, but after logging, it always like throws me out continuously. I'm I'm guessing that's because I'm on a VPN and I have so much browser protection going on here, uh, like trackers and stuff. I, I stop, but it works on an iPhone, um, and it assigns you a random number, and as long as you keep texting every seven days, I want to say or something, just a random text back and forth it'll retain your number so I, I use this a lot for certain services or giving it out to um, you know the doctor's appointment or some other in-person stuff that i'm doing and i don't want my phone number to be in some database i give out a text now number and there's a few other apps like that as well uh, text free is the other app they're both on um, the phone so that because they're very burner ish because I can let it expire and then I can get a new number for free. Google voice is more kind of long term um, stuff. I, I keep one and it's tied to a social media account for quite a uh, quite a while. So that's my phone strategy from mint to some VoIP numbers. I actually go even further where I buy my own numbers. And that's uh, I actually created an app myself called VoIP.OperationPrivacy.com. And that's my um, VoIP portal. So in here, once I log in, I get a interface and stuff. And I can buy as many numbers as I want from Twilio or Telnex, which is the source of most of these. That's beyond the scope of this presentation, but that's what I do today. I buy a phone number for $1, a virtual phone number, and I host it, self-hosted on my own platform. So I can send and receive text messages from this platform. But once you have all those things done, then start creating your alias accounts. To create an alias account, um, what you do first is pick a name, pick a random name. So go to randomuser.me, and there's plenty of other websites like this. I just chose this randomly. Every time you refresh, you get a new name and some other random information about them. I mostly do it for the name. There's a few other websites that'll even give you a random social security number, a random everything. Also, it does give you a date of birth and an address and a lot of other things. I do this because if you choose a name that's in your head, you're, you're going to mess up at some point. You do this enough times and there's going to be a pattern. And anyone looking at you will be like, yeah, this guy always chooses names that end in whatever or Middle Eastern names or uh, he likes, you know, shorter first names or whatever. Keep it random so that there's no algorithm that can look at you. You know, now we have AI and machine learning and all of that stuff. And you can analyze, um, you know, the way you write things, um, pretty much everything at this point. So this is to beat most of those systems and say, yeah, it's completely random. I could have never thought up of a name like Schmidt or whatever. Um, so that it makes me more unique or my alias is more unique not unique but at least not tied to me that yeah michelle didn't come up with this some other person did or whatever um, so you generate names like that and when you stick to one create multiple profiles for that person now what image should you use you can go to places like so you, you probably know this person does not exist there's another website called this x does not exist.com this is a collection of all the uh, similar websites, like this sketch does not exist. This rental does not exist. This is actually cool. So if you're posting up pictures of uh, your home, let's say on Instagram, on your fake sock puppet Instagram account, um, you can take pictures from this website, this rental does not exist.com. You refresh it and new random pictures should come up. Maybe after a few minutes, they refresh or whatever, but it's randomly generated. So now you know you're not using someone else's actual pictures. So that was this X does not exist. There's actually a better one I have, uh, which is this MP does not exist. The website is not truly that. Um, but if you just Google this MP does not exist. Here's what's good about this. Every time a randomly generated image pops up, it's like a, you know, 
MP or member of parliament, but they're professional poses. They're all dressed professionally, usually in a suit and tie. They're looking at you. The background is all um, flat. There's no like trees and stuff in the background. These type of pictures you can use for um, LinkedIn. Uh, because one issue I always had with this person does not exist was it was so random. Sometimes kids pictures were there. Sometimes their ear was missing or you know, r random stuff was generated. The backgrounds were never right. This gets it right every generation, uh, every time you generate. So I use this for LinkedIn based pictures. So now I have more and more stuff to put in my um, alias account. There's generated dot photos which you can use to generate images to and now there's all sorts of other mid journey and whatever you can use a whole bunch of other ai based tools to um, generate images michelle i got two mm -hmm. questions sure. uh first question from cw uh you know you spoke about changing passwords often uh, what about changing usernames for things like personal bank accounts um, yeah. Do you ever recommend changing the usernames as well? Absolutely. Yeah. I kind of um, touched on it just a bit, bit, but yeah, I should maybe emphasize on it. Yes, change your usernames as well. So emails, passwords, and usernames. So nowadays, a lot of the big bank accounts allow you to sign in with a username and not just email, finally. Um, so when they do that, yeah, change it. Uh, don't keep it the same as your email address. Um, change it to a random username. Like by random, I mean, it shouldn't look like a password, but like password managers like Bitwarden have a feature where you can actually, like, let me show you, generate uh, words instead of just passwords. Um, let it load. So there's a section, uh, come on. All right, it wants to load. So there's a section in it, which uh, under generate random password, you can switch to username. Oh, it's never been this slow. Oh, maybe my Kali Linux is running yeah, in the background. But yeah, so if I go under generate, I can do password or username. So under username, it generates this random, like anybody this or whatever, and I can regenerate. And then I can um, have some rules, capitalize, include numbers or whatever. So use this and maybe use a modification of that. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your username is. It's going in a password manager and it's going to auto populate the username and password field. So who cares what this is? I treat this as another password. Now I have two passwords to get in. So now the perpetrator hacker or somebody who has it from a breach needs to know your username, your password in order to kind of put the two together. So now the username won't give you away anymore. Great, so yeah, thank you. And the second question from Margarita is, do you personally, oops, sorry. Do you personally edit the images before using them or do you just take them as they are? Great question. So I'll, I actually edit some of them some of the times. So if I go to one of my alias accounts on LinkedIn and I'll show you what I did there in a bit. So uh, different browsers, different uh, browser containers, which I'll talk about next. So if I log into my alias LinkedIn account, here I have, let's go through this. Here I have an alias, which is this person. And if I go in her thing, this is a very popular alias account. Everyone wants to be her friend, but her name is Natasha Harris, randomly generated name. Her picture that was generated using, this person does not exist. So this was a while ago when most of the other tools did not exist. Um, so when they generated this image, she was blonde and her skin was much lighter than this. So I actually used, uh, I think some online tool, one of those, or maybe edit photos here. And I changed her to a brunette um, and I darkened the skin slightly just to kind of throw the AI generated versions off because it did look a little bit AI generated. And this one had no ears showing, so this was even better because um, a year or two ago, they weren't really good at generating ears. Now they're pretty bad at generating fingers, uh, six or seven fingers sometimes. But uh, yeah, I would edit the pictures slightly. I wouldn't use them as is. Put some effort into your AIs, uh, into your aliases. Great, thank you. 
got 600 followers on this fake profile. Well, this is going on YouTube, so it's probably going to get burned soon. <laughs> Sorry. <All right. laughs> That's fine. I got plenty of others. Um, so Firefox add-ons. This is probably my biggest tool and most useful ones um, for using Firefox. So a lot of these add-ons that I'm going to go through, like three or four of them, are also available on Chrome, but I use them on Firefox. They're better, they're lighter weight, and um, they, they provide a lot of good functionality. Like this one, for example, multi-account containers. I wish this was a standard feature. Um, so it's a, and it's by Firefox, by the way, so it's very, very legit. So Firefox made a plugin for this. What it does is I can log into multiple um, accounts. So it, it it's like I'm logging into different, completely different containers. Like I logged into LinkedIn without being in a container. Now, if I go into, let's say my personal container called personal, and different tab, same browser, but the cookies have been separated in the backend. All the data in the backend is separated. Mm -hmm. So this browser container doesn't see the other container. There's no cross contamination between them. And now I'm in my actual LinkedIn account. And so similarly, I have so many other containers. I have a container for investigations. So if I do that, I log into my investigations container and log into all of the accounts here. Um, and this way I'm making sure my investigative stuff stays separate from my personal stuff, from you know multiple aliases. So a lot of the times I log into four, four or five different LinkedIn accounts or four or five different um, Facebook accounts or Google accounts and do my investigations across them. I'll do you know a third of my investigation with one LinkedIn account and then a third of it after like an hour or two, I take a break, then I just open up the second container and another account is already logged in there. And then I continue it there. This way, if something, some algorithm, some AI is monitoring me, my traffic in the back end, let's say LinkedIn is monitoring that activity or Facebook is, they don't see the full picture. They see parts of it and it doesn't look that shady. All right. So other browser plugins. So this is a must have multi account containers. The other browser plugin is uBlock origin. I always use I keep this on. So this kind of blocks a lot of um, the um, trackers that are on the website, like I'm on Firefox's website, almost no trackers. If I go on LinkedIn, um, I see a couple of trackers here. Uh, you go to other websites, and you may see uh, a lot more trackers, like this one may have, yeah, maybe a few, like the one I generated stuff here, this has eight that are blocked, it gives you a little number eight. So Google Analytics was blocked on this page, Google Ad Manager, and so many others icons eight.com. So this by default blocks, you know, a, a decent amount of trackers, if it gives you issues, and the page is not loading, which is probably, you know, two, 3% of the time then just disable it, press the button, press refresh, and the page will refresh without this plugin enabled anymore. But it's a good default thing to always have on uBlock Origin. The other add on that I use for Firefox is the user agent switcher. So any site I block a, a browse right now knows I'm coming from Firefox and a Mac. But if I go to this plugin, and I say I want to be seen as coming from Windows and Edge. Now, if I refresh this page, I may not see a difference, but the website will think I'm coming from a Windows device. I'll be honest, this plugin does break a few websites where they just don't work sometimes. So I use it with caution. Like I'll give you an example. Like here's a website called deviceinfo.me. It shows me stuff that this website can see about me. It sees I'm on a Mac um you know which version uh, desktop um, my ip address which is a vpn and it says vpn not detected when i am in fact let me check yep i'm still on a vpn uh, and it actually says new jersey so i'm on a new jersey vpn so it doesn't always detect it right depends on what it has in its database but it shows you a lot of information about me and like i'm using mozilla firefox as the agent 
Now, if I refresh this page and I've set it to Windows and Edge, I haven't tested this, but this should change to Windows. And so there you go. Now it says Operating System Windows 10, where previously it said um, uh, Fire, um, Mac and Firefox was the browser. Now Edge is the browser. Still, it says true browser core is still Firefox. So it's not perfect when you change your browser agent. There's some things that just cannot be changed, like the processing and how it loads the page, the sequence of things that happen, our fingerprints to a certain type of browser or a certain type of operating system. Like somewhere here, it's going to tell me I'm on a Mac um, because of the processor or something. It says user agent still Mozilla. Um, here you go, Apple WebKit. Still detected something to do with Apple, even though everything else is Windows NT, Windows, Windows. Um, so there's some things that will still leak from your browser and you, you can't stop that. It's just the way the technology works. But it's good for at least some of the surface level stuff. Most websites will not go this deep in their logs. They'll just log OS, browser, browser version, and IP address, and that's about it. Because I've seen those logs, I've worked on the network side, I've seen network logs, I've done subpoenas with law enforcement, with Google, Google gives you data about an account and they'll give you basic information like this they won't go as in depth as i've gone here nonetheless know that this information is available for anyone to collect and that's why if that is your threat model then you use um, stuff like browser lane or uh, other browser containers all right any questions um, I kind of had a curious question. I feel like I saw two fields for time zones, one of which was for Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did um, see multiple time zones. So whatever time zone I've set here, and that's another, uh, actually a good segue into um, time zones. You can change your time zone from um, the, the operating system, and that's the time zone it will show in, um, uh, some a website like device info so it takes it from your operating system doesn't mean it's your true time zone so i know a lot of OSINT people like um i have the book extreme privacy by michael basil he sets his time zone in it to california no matter where he is in the world so if his time zone leaks in a browser it'll always show california and his calendars are always set to um you know pacific time zone and, and so he's kind of set it that way because not only do you leak that in a browser you also leak that information in an email that's one way in advanced OSINT when somebody sends you an email and you hit reply the whole email thread is below and in the email thread it'll show the time zone it'll say you know replied at this time and then in brackets there will be a time zone in there and that time zone is that person's computer or uh, outlook's time zone or whatever they've set it to so yeah that's that's a good one it gets it from um, the OS itself and the other time zone it, it guesses based on um, the IP address so it guessed it here as New Jersey so it's going to give me multiple different times here so it's all spoofable good question so user agent switcher is one there's another one location guard and this is where you can spoof the actual GPS location so remember some sites ask you, uh, there's a little pop up that comes up here and says, should I share the location with the website or the website is asking permission to share your location. That is a much more accurate way to share location, like on Google Maps and stuff, it'll often show you um, and Firefox will ask you permission. And I always say decline or I just set it hard coded in the Firefox settings to just ignore websites that ask me for my location. But instead of doing that, you can actually enable this plugin, Location Guard, and set it to a certain um, location. You can set it on the GPS and say, yeah, my location is somewhere else. And the next time a website asks you share location, say, yes, share location, and this new location will be shared instead of um, your true location. And that can be used for stuff like uh, Snapchat or TikTok and stuff where Sometimes they want you to be in the same location or uh, what's that app called next door. Uh, there's a website uh, for it as well. And when you're in the next door, next door will only allow you to search within your neighborhood because it's a neighborhood app. 
how do you spoof it? Well, with apps like this, you can say, yeah, I'm truly in that neighborhood that I want to do investigations for. So that's where it's kind of useful. Yeah, so once you have that infrastructure in place, now go ahead and make your alias accounts. So there's a alias account I made called Chef Sammy. Um, so if I go on Twitter and if I go on, what is it, Facebook and Instagram as well, but let's open these two for now. I've used all those same techniques to make alias accounts. This is a fresh alias account. And what you see in these alias accounts is uniformity in your sock puppets. So if I made one uh, sock puppet here called whatever Chef Sammy, I'll use the same name and I'll create, oh, look at that. So I changed the browser agent on this saying Windows and uh, Edge and Facebook didn't like it. It actually went to m.facebook.com, the mobile version, where I didn't tell it to go on the mobile version. So it's kind of screwing up uh, how the website looks. Uh, let me disable some of these. So I have a lot of extensions here, as I'll show you. So when there's too many extensions uh, in here, that may also screw up some things. But um, I wanted to disable one of them, this one. All right, let's go back to, OK, now it works. I knew which one was causing issues. So now I'll go back to the default. And now Facebook should work fine change this some sites will give you issues with user agent swapping so now the, the chef here is has a similar name he has a true name of sammy alberto whereas in the other one it was just uh, chef sammy so if somebody's looking me up it kind of looks legit it's like oh this guy's called chef sammy but oh i found his real identity uh, he's actually called sammy alberto and same picture so i tied them together exactly same things we do in OSINT just reverse them and do it for privacy or for sock puppet purposes as well. So throw people off, make them feel like they've found something when they really haven't. And those are your sock puppets. Instead of just making random sock puppets with no profile image and no activity, put some activity in it as well. Share stuff like certain you know videos or things like neutral stuff um, and display it across the board in two or three different social media accounts. And that, I believe, is a better way to do sock puppet accounts than just, you know, randomly doing it for the heck of just accessing uh, the website. All right. Questions? All right, so we talked about randomization of stuff. We talked about some browser plugins. Any questions on browser plugins? I only touched Firefox. Nope. With that, we advanced to sock puppet accounts, create multiple sock puppet accounts. And not just multiple across social media accounts, like the Twitter, Snapchat, and um, you know, make a Mastodon account, make uh, a few others with the same persona, and then repeat with another persona, another individual, and then have a few, like three or four other accounts. But also create multiple accounts for the same platform, because you will get banned <laughs> almost immediately at some points. Like I've had over like, 10 plus LinkedIn accounts banned last year. Some were like immediate bans, some were after like a month, some after six months. And when they ban you, they're like, they ask for a passport copy. I'm like, well, too bad. <laughs> uh, they're burnt. They're considered unrecoverable. And I just move on and I create a new one. Um, so they will get burnt and or banned at some point. And you will sometimes need to use multiple accounts. Like in this demo, I showed a few um, sock puppet accounts, a few alias accounts. I cannot use those for any legitimate investigations. For those, I have other accounts that I didn't sign into yet, and I'll use that for that. But if at any point they get compromised, um, maybe because I've communicated with the perpetrator um, who I was trying to get, if I've communicated or they've noticed it, that's a, that is dedicated to them and them alone. I will not use that account for someone else. Um, for investigating something else. So have multiple accounts, have multiple Gmail accounts, multiple everything. Because also you never know when you may need one. Um, like somebody may say, we're, we're, I want to share a Google file with you or through Google Docs and I want to make you as a collaborator. If you're like, oh, I'm against Google, they're not privacy conscious and blah, blah, blah. 
uh, well, you've just knocked yourself out of that game. And now how are you going to communicate with that person or that account or whatever when you don't have a burner account? So I always have a burner account on each and every one of those platforms. Um, also, because when platforms are new, it's easier to get burner accounts. Their checks and balances are pretty low. Uh, when they become more mature and people start abusing them, like now we see people abusing LinkedIn accounts a lot. Um, that's why LinkedIn has cracked down. Microsoft has cracked down. Um, now they check your IPs and stuff like that. So get in earlier. Uh, it's easier. Um, and create multiple accounts. If I can create one easily, I almost always create like five more. Uh, because I'm like, it's, it's so easy to create multiple accounts. You never know. All right, let's talk about a little bit of um, misdirection and disinformation. So if you're ever exposed, we do all the privacy stuff you need to before an investigation. Um, at some point, you may leak some information, a username, a, a name, a, a phone number or whatever. You want to proactively spread some disinformation or misdirect a user at times. And there's many, many ways to do it. And for the sake of time, what are we on time? Okay, we have time. Um, I'll show you a few of those methods. Yeah, and, uh, and we're, go we're good to go over too if you need to. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to make this like a tutorial or, uh, of sorts. I just want to give you like quick and easy doses of what I do, how I do it. And because this conversation yeah, can go forever. <laughs> there's books written about it and stuff. But uh, so here's how I would do it. So there's, um, yeah, so one of the ways is I would set traps for myself and others. So canarytokens.org is a great way to set traps. Um, for those who don't know, Canary Tokens generates a link that if you click on that link uh, somewhere in an email or in a doc file or you're sending it to someone or you have it posted on your website or a fake account, which you know no one should find and they click on it, well, you get information about that person. You get an email saying this IP address clicked on this link, this user agent was there and this is their rough location on, on the map. Um, so this is quite useful to set uh, kind of trip wires around your parameter. So I, so as you can see, if I go to canarytokens.org, I get blocked. Um, it's in my deny list in, um, uh, what do you call it, next DNS. Because mm -hmm. if I'm setting traps for myself in my computer, and I have put these links in various places, like I have a, um, a canary token in an Excel file in one of my folders. And if you open the Excel file, it has some random usernames and random passwords, nothing real, but it also has a hidden canary token inside it, which kind of goes in the internet, downloads a one by one image pixel file. And when it does, it triggers the canary in the background and I get a notification. So I want to know if somebody's stolen my files, maybe through a hard drive, maybe through some other means and they try to open it and it gets triggered because it says passwords.xls on it. Um, when I was testing it internally, uh, I was opening it many times. So I was, I kept triggering it. So I blocked it. So I'm like, yeah, I don't want to be a victim of it either. Or if, if I trip on someone else's canary, because others can use the same technique, I should get blocked immediately. Like my network should block that traffic and they should never get that canary response. So that's why I blocked it in my own network, in my own house. It's uh, this whole domain is blocked. Yeah, I was just thinking that would be a good idea just to just to block it in general from yourself triggering other people's tokens. Yeah, both. Yeah, I, I do have a couple questions here uh, before mm -hmm. we move on. Sure. Uh, so Nixie was asking for Facebook. I want to join groups with my sock puppet to find more info about some groups, but some groups want you to have a certain number of friends. How do you go about adding more friends? Just randomly add people? Yeah. So that's what I would do. So don't go trigger happy with that because Facebook will block you. Um, so add people in certain bigger neutral groups. So what I do is I find really large things to like, like, um, you know, news agencies or big celebrity groups I'll follow because everyone's following those. So I'm like, um, I, I, uh, I don't stand out. And then within those groups, as people are commenting, I'll comment as well. And then 
randomly like other people's comments. So now I have some activity on Facebook. Now the plat platform knows that I'm active. And then a few people, who, if they comment back or whatever to my comments or, or something, I'll add them. And my chances of getting accepted to that are pretty high at that point because I've established something common. I'm in a common group or follow a common thing. Uh, same thing with groups. If you want to join groups, first join a bunch of larger random groups, which you know they will accept. Maybe nonprofits. Nonprofits will not deny anyone. So that's a good type of group, like a really big nonprofit. Nothing too specific that uh, may, um, you know, put you at risk. Like nothing controversial, but something very generic, you know, for a nonprofit for animals or, or children or refugees or whatever. And yeah, get accepted to those groups. This way, when you add yourself or ask to be added to another bigger group that's very specific to something, yeah, they look at your history. They they get a little snapshot of this person is part of five groups. Here's some of the groups or 20 groups. It makes you more legit. So you need to kind of spend some time on your sock puppets first. Don't just create a sock puppet and start using it for anything immediately because you're going to come into problems especially with facebook and instagram with twitter and stuff i think it doesn't matter but with facebook and linkedin especially it matters nobody wants to add a person with one friend it's like a <laughs> big red flag so uh, okay. i would say with linkedin the easiest method is um add um recruiters recruiters love to be added they'll never you know reject anyone and that, that leads into the next question from D. How long do you let a sock grow before engaging with it? So primarily, that question has a slight problem with it, engaging with someone. OSINT does not involve engaging with anyone. So if you're doing it for OSINT work, you can't engage with a person that's no longer OSINT. Now it's active engagement. Now it falls under the realm of maybe social engineering and it can become risky you know, with certain laws or whatever. But yeah, so if you are engaging, you need to kind of groom your sock puppet to a level where it looks legitimate. Like look at it from the outside, like log out or go into a se separate container and look at your sock puppet account as if it was someone else. Does it look fake? Um, if it does look fake to you, it's going to look fake to someone else as well. So once you're comfortable enough looking at it and saying, yeah, this person has a bunch of friends and whatever, um, if there's no major flags raised to you, then start using it. And for each platform, the answer is different. So for example, like with LinkedIn, when somebody tries to add me, I just do a quick check. It, it kind of shows on their profile, you have seven friends. I'm like, hmm, it kind of looks shady. The picture, now I start noticing other things. I'm like, yeah, the picture looks like it's generated using AI. This person joined like one week ago. Uh, reject, sorry. But if you, some platforms will show you the date you joined. Actually, most of them now do. So the earlier you have an account, so that's why I said when, um, when I create accounts, I just create them in bulk. I just keep creating it um, until I get kind of blocked or whatever. And now I let it age for months before I actually use it for anything useful. Like right now I have a few accounts. I just created like a few weeks ago or months ago. I'm just using them to kind of sign in and just do random activity uh, with it. So OSINT is fine as long as you're not engaging with anyone, use it for OSINT purely and then use multiple ones for OSINT. So now you're like putting some data and making it more legit for all the accounts, randomizing it. And then when you need to engage, now you're going to burn those accounts eventually. So now pick the ones that are either the oldest or the ones that look more most legit for your um, engagement purposes. So it could be you're engaging with a person who wants to engage with a child. So use your child account or a male or a female or someone from a certain part of the world. So it really depends on your use case. So Canary Tokens was one... Um, method. I can unblock it right now, but you guys can just go to Canary Tokens and check it out for yourself. I use that to set tripwires. Another website I use recently, I just got to know about this was telex.run. It just produces short links and it's very similar to uh, uh, Canaries, um, but 
it's very limiting where it'll only produce a link and you can use that link for to forward to basically anything else i i saved this under my bookmarks because it's new a lot of the domains as they become older um, things start to block them they go into block lists uh, in firewalls and, and other threat intelligence lists and stuff and this website is fairly new and it's not made for like the canary purposes to be set as tripwires it's more for threat intelligence you put a link somewhere else and give it to you know someone it, it forwards to something legit but then you get like information on who clicked it and um, mostly from marketing purposes there's a few websites that use those type of links this is for threat intelligence purposes but again use different methods to to set traps uh, around another thing for disinformation is exif data so anytime you're putting up pictures so my sock puppets have pictures i strip out all the metadata in the picture and then i upload it even though i know the platform is going to strip it for me most platforms do but i don't take the risk i just remove everything and one way to remove it and actually insert fake metadata is this website the xifer.net and in this website you can drop a file here uh, practically any type of file um, image file or doc file or whatever and then as you drop it an edit box will pop up oops let me not drop a file but um, once you drop it in here there will be an edit box and you can edit all the metadata in it you can set gps coordinates title um, you name it there's going to be 50 different fields that you can edit edit a few basic ones um, it's maybe a gps location put a fake gps location in it and then upload it on the internet somewhere i have a bunch of those files on online i have it on Flickr. i have a Flickr account with some fake files and it shows my fake location so if somebody were to stumble upon my fake fl flicker account which is in my true name they'll be like aha there's a picture in there with a, a geolocation on it because Flickr does not remove uh, geolocation or any metadata from its images that's the whole goal of Flickr. so there are use cases for this or if you're sending a file let's say an image file to a perpetrator and you're allowed to engage with them send the image but then put in some metadata in it that falsifies that data because if your adversary is smart like you uh, even the slightest tech savvy they're they're going to look through uh, image metadata so never underestimate your opponent so there's you know there there may be a level of paranoia in most of these things but there's actually a story which which kind of got me um, recently I, I saw this documentary on uh, Netflix it's called uh, web of make-believe and there's two episodes about the stingray in it and i highly advise everyone to watch this uh, stingray episode because here was a hacker who was pretty smart this guy and he was evading law enforcement for quite a while he used all the techniques i went through and 10 times more like he was on the extreme side of things he had a laptop with a LTE card in it, never used public Wi-Fi. Um, eventually, when he got caught, he went to jail and he just could not figure out how he got caught. He's like, I used the best of the best OPSEC available. I was everything in cash, wearing a hoodie and all that stuff. And he's like, how did I get caught? And law enforcement wouldn't tell him, FBI wouldn't tell him. Um, they had classified documents. So he studied law while he was in jail for, for a while. And you can watch the whole interview, but but I'm gonna spoil it for you anyways uh, it was he discovered stingrays he discovered that law enforcement was using a tool called stingrays and this tool allowed them to figure out what lte device he was using um, he was using something that goes in his laptop uh, which had a sim card in it and they tracked that sim card they knew the traffic was coming from that IP which belonged to this SIM card and they narrowed it down to a certain building location, raided the building and caught him. So when he figured out what this device was, he actually fought the case and got free because stingrays were not and are not legal. Law enforcement still uses them, but they're basically prying on you and basically spying on everyone's cell networks. They're getting their your IMEI numbers and stuff and creating a database on 
where you've been, when you've been there uh, tracking all the data that's going back and forth. So he actually won the kiss and he's a free man. That's why he gave this interview and stuff. But it's amazing on how he discovered what stingrays are. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't know that this device exists, which is intercepting all of our, or can intercept all of our cell communications. And this makes sense now, why to use VoIP numbers, why to use VPNs when you're on traffic, and why not to travel with your SIM card and make calls with your SIM phone or use it as uh, you know, two-factor authentication and all those things, because all of that can be intercepted with a device like a Stingray. So not only is this real, this was a very long time ago when they had Stingrays. Imagine what they have now. A little bit of paranoia, but stories like this are interesting because these are real case stories of how really good hackers who had pretty good OPSEC got caught with devices like this. So I personally um, don't travel out with my phone in certain places when I don't need to, because I know if not a Stingray, but the ISP knows my exact whereabouts just because I carry a SIM card with me. So I'm careful sometimes. So there's websites like this, you should always test yourself out to see if something's leaking. Whoer.net will show you what's your IP address, what else are you leaking, any DNS info, um, you know, browsers and browser agents and um, stuff like that. And they'll get it wrong every now and then, like proxy, not using, anonymizer, not using, when I am. So it's good that this IP address of this VPN isn't in their list because there's no other way they can tell I'm on a VPN besides the actual IP address. Um, so always, you know, do a self audit and see um, what your footprint uh, looks like with that. Hold on. I had a slide about it. Um, yeah, go hack yourself. <laughs> self audit, do a self audit. And one of the ways you can do a self audit is, uh, is alerting. So before I move to alerting, we do a lot of OSINT and there are hundreds of sources of OSINT. Like look at all of the sources, like you can look up your own vehicle records. So when I say go hack yourself, do OSINT on yourself like you would to a criminal and check out all these resources, check out the dark web, check out your IP website, your criminal records, your, all of that is public, your you know, cryptocurrency, if you've dealt with it, see if you can map it out and see if it's traceable. Um, you know, look, look at your house online, maps, geo intelligence on your own pictures, you know, take it to the extreme, just do, I know it's scary, but do research on yourself. There's a webcast that I came out with uh, a couple of months ago, it was called um, um, similar to go hack yourself, uh, go stalk yourself. Yeah, it's called go stalk yourself, where I stalk myself. So I kind of expose a lot about myself, me being a very private person. Uh, I live and breathe OSINT and privacy. And yet I put that out in the public. A lot of the mistakes I've made because I've corrected them. Um, a lot of the times I've been vulnerable and I've just let it all out there because I'm pretty confident at this stage that what I'm doing is, is fine. And it educates others to do uh, something similar and to know that it can be done. So do a self audit, um, do what you do on the OSINT side um, and see if you're leaking any information. There's stuff like browser leaks and, and stuff just on a browser level. I'll pause there for any questions. A few more things I have, um, file sharing. A lot of the times I have to file share between people. I use send.tresorit.com, a free file sharing service. I'm actually a paid member for Trezor. It's a pretty good service and alternative to Dropbox and Google Drive and, and all of that. But they have a free service. Firefox used to have uh, the same service called send.firefox.com, but they don't anymore. So now this is the next best service. Drag and drop any file here creates a temporary seven day link up to five gigs, share it with anyone and the file is encrypted, it gets destroyed after a while. So that's how I file share uh, privately with, with people. Um, unless I have other accounts, like I have a Proton mail account, so I have Proton Drive. So I actually use Proton Drive now to share files. But this is the other quick method. Um, 
last thing is alerts. So when you've done OSINT on yourself, you've done all the privacy stuff, now you want to sit, relax, and not be paranoid, not worry about what information is going to leak about me online that I won't know about. So you're not constantly searching yourself, do it periodically, like once a quarter or whatever, just do random searches. But then you can have sites like Google uh, alerts. So here's a Google alerts on my alias account. You can set alerts for anything. Like I had this alert set on while I was hacking first because I was monitoring when is this thing coming up for 2025. And as you start typing, let's do 2026, no results found. 2202 or 2025, some things will be found on each search. It kind of gives you a preview. So it gave me a preview of what will be found in the sample search. And you can set it up as an alert. And now, if anything new is found in the search, they'll send you an email with this list. And you, you'll only get updates from, from this point onwards. So it's a pretty good way to set alerts for yourself. Um, it's an old way to do it. It's been around for a while. But I always like multiple ways to do the same thing. Google Alerts is not the best. Some It's hit or miss sometimes. But... I use three services and all to track myself. One is Google Alerts. Another one is distill.io. So D-I-S-T-I-L-L.io. Distill.io allows me to do certain cool things. So if I go into this one, so I've set a alert for my book. So the Phantom CISO, I think if I click on it, it goes straight to my book. So what I've done here is, um, I released the book and I was telling people go like put uh, uh, put in a review if you've read it and bought it and stuff. And uh, Mike, I hope you put in a good review as well. Uh, but as people put reviews, the the ratings go up. It says 15 ratings there. I don't want to monitor the changes in the whole page because there's things that move around randomly. There's suggestions that, that come about and ads may be inserted in, in certain search, searches. So this page is going to actually change every time I load this. Like it's actually still loading here for suggested books. So Google alert will go crazy on this. It'll be like, oh, change detected at every load. What this still does is I can hone in on just this little thing. So if, if I go in here and actually inspect this element, it has a unique tag to it. And I can just monitor that one tag. It has a class and it has... Um, oops, sorry, span ID. It has a span ID and this ID is very unique, arc custom review text. So I can say just monitor this span uh, ID and nothing else on the page. If this changes, send me an alert. And that's what I'm actually doing here. Uh, once I uh, create a new one, that's create a new monitor. I can monitor a web page and I can monitor granular things like that, put in the web page, it'll, it'll show me more options. So distill is one of those things. I can monitor entire pages for changes. Um, I do that for a lot of like this I had, worldgameprotection.com slash Michelle. Um, I was presenting there and they hadn't advertised it yet. So I said, if Google here comes up with a search result here and check it every day or whatever, um, it, it's a scraper at this point. Uh, if there's a change in the results, send me an alert. And it was pretty accurate at this point. So, and this is by the way, all a free version. All these tools are free. Um, they have a limit, I think up to five you can set. But guess what? Look at my username up here. It's pretty unique. <laughs> it's using a DuckDuckGo email address, a random username. I can create many uh, of these. And then the third one, which is probably one of the best ones, is visualping.io. With visualping, I've set a search parameter for uh, my name. So if my name pops up on Google search, I should get an alert if there are certain changes. So as this page loads, you see I've set alerts on, there's actually a Google string here, and that string, I'll show you in a bit what it is. So let me copy this string in a browser. So this is a unique string which is generated not just with my full name, but only past month's results. So I selected past month and it changed the string up here. I, I only want to know changes within the past month because I'm, I'm doing this pretty often. And the frequency of that I've set every week. 
So every week, check this. If in the past month there have been any changes, because what Google does is it sometimes randomizes stuff. Something that's really old may have a better SEO today may come up the, on the first page of Google, and then I'm, I'll be getting like not accurate results. So I've said, yeah, only search for, search for stuff that's that's been there for like a month or less. So new stuff. And then I'm doing text compare. It's just going through the text, not visual comparing. And I'm using a proxy here from coming from New York. It'll search the page. And I'm giving it seven seconds to load because sometimes there's some JavaScript and stuff that needs to load in the back end um, instead of just two seconds. And that's about it. I mean, I'm just looking at that and I actually get some pretty good results. Um, I would share a email I got, but I have to open up my email client for it. But I just got an email uh, earlier today about a result and it just said one result on it, which is this first thing you see, it had a result with just this. And the alert was new link found with your search criteria. And it was this, I'm like, huh, gov tech, this, this person just published an article about me two or three days ago. And they kind of re uh, did it on Twitter and I got an alert. So it's pretty good uh, visual ping. I think they posted this yesterday and I got the alert today. So while it may not be real time, it's pretty good. So if someone else was searching stuff about me that, hey, Michelle sucks and let's dox him or whatever, I would get that alert immediately. And it would give me a lot more time to deal with it, do something about it than for the internet to kind of, you know, blow it out of proportion first. And then it's kind of like too late at that point. So yeah, these three tools I use for for a, a lot of things. I actually use it for CFPs as well. So monitoring CFP time you see there. I used to monitor that website a lot. Um, so cfptime.org, because I used to apply for a lot of call for presentations and stuff. And every time a new one would be uh, published on the site, I would get an alert because they don't have an alerting system here, but I made my own. So there's a lot of use cases for this, monitoring yourself, monitoring websites, monitoring your adversary. You're doing OSINT on a profile on Facebook or whatever, put that thing here. And if they post something new, uh, you'll get an alert without checking it daily. Questions, comments? And I wanted to uh, say thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to get going, but I appreciate all this information you have shared and tips and tricks and just advice. I'm a newbie for cybersecurity, so um, you made me like remind myself of how I loved uh, Kaylee Linux during my computer forensics <laughs> class and um yeah so thank you for your time i really appreciate it i appreciate it thanks for being here yeah. a couple questions in chat uh margarita was asking do you have any book recommendations that they're big on reading oh yeah the phantom season no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh, book recommendations on privacy yeah i would have one recommendation uh, extreme privacy that's a book by michael basil and extreme privacy has everything in it from a extreme perspective, not everything um, is practical, in my opinion. But again, it's, it's extreme. So read all of it, and then apply what applies to you in your real life, at least you know what, um, what all options there are, and what the world of privacy encompasses. And then you can apply you know, a subset of that for for yourself. Um, now he has a digital version of those books, so you can get an ebook uh, copy of it. But yeah, that's one thing. Like on a technical side, that's what I would recommend. There's a lot of other privacy-based books that are not technical. They talk more about government and other stuff in, on the privacy fields, more for journalism and stuff. I haven't read any of those, and I have no interest in that. Um, so I can't recommend anything else other than this. Yeah, and the, the great thing about Michael Bazel's books is that he updates them about every two years. Uh, as yeah, so now he out. stopped doing the book. So this is the last printed edition that he'll come out with. Now he's going to do everything online on his ebooks. And now the updates are much more frequent than every two years. Now they're as needed. So great. every couple of weeks, he'll have a free update for the people who paid for the book. You'll get like an email. Even more incentive to buy his books. Yeah. I'm actually on one of the in, a, in one of the chapters of the books where he talks about VoIP 
and self-hosting your voice over IP infrastructure. Um, he talks about a good four or five pages on how to set up VoIP Suite, which is the app I, I built. Um, and I took his feedback um, and we kind of built it to meet that specific need, a gap in the industry, which was there is no self-hosted voice over IP system that's available. You have to go to other people's platforms. So I have a mention in the book as well. Yeah. And did you, I'm sorry, did you mention both books? Because I know you mentioned Extreme Privacy, but he also has his OSINT techniques OSINT book. book. Yeah. Yeah. For, if, for OSINT, then yeah, sure. I would definitely recommend the OSINT book as well. Um, both of those, like I have multiple copies of all of those books uh, on my bookshelf here. Okay. Uh, Khalil asks, how can one go about extending these techniques to their less tech savvy family members? Uh, and Margarita commented in on that question, or even our kids. So that's a great question I get all the time. Less tech savvy people around us will have problems and they will come to you. And that's a time for educating and telling them, I told you so. No. <laughs> that's a time to kind of show them like, look, this is what can go wrong. Here's how we can fix these things so that it doesn't happen again. I've gotten a lot of family members on password managers after they got hacked on MFA after they got hacked, um, changing like the privacy settings after they were a victim of stalking. Um, and I'm like, yeah, change these things now proactively. So I often have these conversations with people. Sometimes I just will expose them like in front of them, like, like log in, like look at their account or something and say, hey, look, you're exposing your home address on this or your kids' photos on blah, blah, blah. Uh, you think, you know, a, a, a pervert won't look at this and whatever and they're like oh yeah i never thought of it that way so i think like a hacker and i show them that this is what a hacker would think like and that's when they start thinking different so you have to show them the other side because i think part of the problem is just my opinion is they don't know the possibilities that are out there they think that people are very innocent and oh who would do that who would stalk me who would be that sick who would be that perverted who would want to destroy my life to that extreme and send random pizzas to my house or dox me or squat me or swat me um you know swatting exists and tell them stories about swatting tell them stories about doxing and how it changed someone's life like upside down that's when they start listening so make it personal that would be my advice and for kids um this is the best time for them to learn about privacy I've told the story before, so I apologize, apologies if you've heard this, but with my own kids, when I go through drive throughs or I go to a restaurant to pick up food, I obviously never give my real name. I make up a name that's maybe close enough to my ethnicity so I can like get away with it when I'm saying my name. Like I won't say I'm John. I can't, you know, get away with John. Um, maybe a mic I can get away with, a short for Michelle, but I'll pick names closer to my ethnicity and I'll give it to people. And my kids will be the first one to, to tell me they're like, but that's not your name, dad. Why are you lying? And I'll go, it's not lying. It's this is I'm now I'm, I start to educate them and I tell them this is the opportunity for privacy. I tell them, why should I give them my real name? Um, right now it's my real name. Then they're going to ask me for my email address or phone number. What if they start calling me and then threatening me? And then they come to my home because they have my home address. Do you want these people to come knocking on your door with a gun or something? And, uh, you know, it's, it's a threat. And I create this random situation that you know, will probably never happen. But, you know, kids, they play games and, and stuff. So they have a good imagination. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we don't want to be in that position. And we, we don't want to be in a threatening situation. So I'm like, that's why I don't give out my name. So I, I kind of blow it out of proportion, but it's fun with kids because they learn and it does make a difference. So I, I do it for fun and they realize I do it for fun. But the other day I saw my daughter playing um, uh, what, Roblox, a uh, stupid game, uh, in my opinion, like there's pedophiles on that game. Um, she was playing it and instead of me being a dad and scolding her and saying, what the hell are you doing? This is like, get off this game, delete it or whatever. No. I sat with her for a while, saw what she did, and I asked, what's this name? I saw a username up there. I'm like, that, who, who's this person? She's like, oh, that's me. I'm like, but that's not your name. She's like, yeah, but you said never to use your real name. So I used an alias. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I was so proud of her at that moment. I'm like, wow, she's a kid. And she actually took this advice, you know, 
in the background and implemented it in her life. So kids absorb everything you do and say. So lead by example, do this private life, private strategy. And if anything, it gives people encouragement to do it. Maybe they were on the fence on not using their real phone number or whatever, but seeing you do it and they're next in line for that order or whatever, they're, they're going to do it too. So it gives other people encouragement. That's how I kind of spread some of the, um, the these tactics. Yeah, that's the one thing we've done with, with our uh, child as well is always express that, hey, you don't know who you're talking to when you're in those games, Roblox, Rec Room, whatever, Minecraft. <laughs> um, not to ever give out your real name, give a fake name. Um, don't even give your address. Don't even give your state. Uh, right. You know, just make up something. And the people don't need to know the people who need to know already know. Um, but yeah, I was just thinking about your drive through and I was like, yeah, you don't want the Hamburglar to visit the house. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, got another question from Nixie, uh, uh, off topic slightly. Uh, did you draw your avatar art? It's AI generated. <laughs> okay. I didn't draw it. Huh? I would have drawn something similar to this, but I was experimenting with AI. My picture on, um, uh, LinkedIn is also completely AI generated using mid journey, just prompts. And it looks surprisingly close to me, uh, the, the LinkedIn one. And people are like, why would you put your real picture on LinkedIn? You're such a hypocrite. I'm like, <laughs> it's not a real picture. Look at it closely. It's completely AI generated, although it kind of looks like me. So that's why I actually put it there. I'm like, oh, facial recognition will never catch it, but people can tell, yeah, that's kind of like you. So I created that little balance. Thanks. All right. Are there any uh, any other questions? I don't have any more here on chat. So feel free to dump your questions in the chat or unmute and ask them personally. All right. Hearing none, I will stop recording now. So.